My name is Robert David Hall, and I'm an actor, a musician, and a disability advocate. I've been acting on CSI for, we're starting our 12th season, and I play Dr. Robbins, the coroner, and it's uh, been a great, great gig, as we say. I love the people I work with. Always something new every week, so that's great. I'm married to Judy. We've been married 12 years. And uh, I'm the father of Andrew, who's 30. They're the two loves of my life. Well, I knew I wanted to be a musician when I was three or four years old. I saw, uh, I think it was Roy Rogers playing the guitar in a cowboy movie, and I, I was mesmerized. When I was in college, I, instead of studying, I would practice for hours. I, I managed to get through UCLA somehow. I was a professional musician in my 20s. I played in a band at night. I worked a radio job first thing in the morning. I studied acting. In short, I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. And when I was just shy of 31, I was injured in a pretty horrible accident. I had a, a small foreign car that I was selling that night. And I was driving it up the freeway to the guy who was going to buy it. And coming the other way was a guy driving an 18-wheel truck. He'd stopped for a six-pack lunch, said he lost control of the truck and came through the middle of the freeway, and he ran over the car with me in it. I survived the crash, but my gas tank exploded, and I uh, was burned over 65% of my body. A couple of very brave people heard my screams and got me out of the car. An ambulance got me to the UC Irvine Burn Center. I remember the surreal nature of the whole thing. If I live to be a hundred, it'll it'll always seem odd that it happened to me. I I was having surgeries and skin grafts and amputation surgeries left and right. Both my legs were amputated, the first one above the knee, and then over the course of the summer, I lost my second leg in stages. Well, this program was started by the Department of Defense to help wounded soldiers that were coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. So we had a lot of soldiers injured by explosive devices. It is really the first time that we've had a prosthetic limb system that has the functionality of, of the human arm. You kind of get this first initiative to support your military population. But it, there's always that transition then into the civilian population. So most prosthetic users today still use a hook. And the hook is something that has been around for you know at least 150 years. The goal was to really make a revolutionary leap in the, the technology. We can do very complex things with our hand and arm, and what we wanted to do was design a limb that could do all those things, and not only be able to, to replicate the motion, but also to be able to sense touch. I don't think there are any other devices out there that no. do this. And to provide the wearer of the prosthetic the ability to use the arm in a very natural way. So that means controlling it via thought. This morning, I have uh, an appointment with David Cooney at Swiss Balance Prosthetics in Santa Monica. I'm in the process of getting fit for some new 
artificial legs, new prosthesis, because I've lost a bunch of weight over the last few years. I need, uh, I need new limbs. I'm a double amputee, what's called AKBK, uh, B BK below the knee, AK above the knee. I wear some of the latest prosthetics. This is called a C leg, and it's, uh, I plug it in like a computer every night, and it helps me walk better. You're not kicking that left side either. No, I'm not. No. Essentially, what it does is it so. can sense the way I walk. Okay. It kind of helps me sense the ground. It's, it's working better. Good. Now, as for the comfort on the big, uh, BK side, I'm, it's not bad. Good. I can walk without a crutch, but I, I use a, a, a cane, a modified Canadian crutch, because I like to move fast. I like to get where I'm going. You think, how many ways can they murder somebody on a TV show? And I, I met some FBI guys in Washington and who loved the show, and they said to me, oh, we have something for you. Oh, and they gave me the, the FBI book on murder investigation. Like, I'm going to you know, read right, this yeah, on the yeah. plane home or something. But I gave it to the writers of our show, and oh, they, they, they jumped up and down. They I loved bet. it. I, I don't think of life as quite as unfair as I used to. You know, I mean, uh, the universe didn't do me in, gravity did me in. You know, a, a truck ran me over in my car. Sometimes people think you're fragile if you're disabled. I'm not fragile. I'm Irish and Welsh, and I'm stubborn as hell. And I think the best is yet to come. Most of the time, my artificial limbs serve a wonderful function. They get me into my car, which gets me to Universal Studios. And I go to my trailer, and then to makeup, and then on the set, and nobody looks at me and goes, he's wearing prosthetics. You know, they just think, oh, it's, it's David Hall. Good, he's here to work. I work out with my trainer, Alexander Denk. About six years ago, Billy Peterson, who was then the star of CSI, said, hey, you ought to go visit my gym. I was over 200 pounds and about 212 pounds. He never ever complains. It's very interesting. David is a very good example. It doesn't matter what challenges you have to overcome. So that's the inspiration for me. There are people that talk about stuff and there are people that do stuff. Some days I don't want to work out and I'll come here anyway and I'll tell him, I don't want to be here today. And he'll go, tough you are. And then about 20 minutes into it, I'll say, I'm glad I'm here. How's life different? Completely. I used to pole vault. I used to run. I used to bound up stairs two at a time. I hiked up mountains and I did things like that. I loved curling my toes around the sand at the beach. I liked hot white socks out of the dryer, putting them on. I loved my cowboy boots and my Adidas running shoes. I thought they were great. I have cool shoes now, but I just don't feel them. You know, everybody goes, oh, those are nice shoes. How do they feel? I go, oh, great, you know. I don't feel my shoes. Now I weigh about 168. The lighter you are, the easier it is to walk on your prosthesis. And I want to walk till I'm a very, very old man.
our limb was designed to be able to operate with full neural control. The way neural control works is that if, if I can no longer use my arm because the arm is missing, when I think about moving my arm, those signals travel through my brain and they reach a point where they can't go any further. When you lose that limb, you don't kill off that portion of your brain. So what we do is essentially is measure those signals. We can measure them either directly in the brain or we can measure them in the residual nerves that are left over after the amputation. We can listen to those nerves, pick up those signals. Then what we can do is determine you know, what it is you wanted to do. Well, I wanted to bend my elbow. I wanted to open and close my hand. And we can make the, the prosthetic limb do that. Most amputees have what's known as a phantom limb. Even though the limb is gone, they still sense that the limb is there. And, and sometimes they can control it, and sometimes it can cause a lot of pain. The ability to still naturally envision that phantom limb often helps patients because they can still, at least to some degree, envision moving the hand that's missing or the arm that's missing into those postures in space. So the time for them to learn how to use it is minutes sometimes. Because they're not really learning to do anything new. What we do is teach the arm to understand what they want to do, and that's a big difference. So each of the, the, the fingertips have a rays of sensors in them that can detect vibration, they can detect pressure, they can detect temperature. For an amputee, he or she has the chance to actually experience a sense of touch. And that is something that is very unique. The big life-changing element is having to think less about what they're doing, the ability to do it intuitively. And that's one of the really exciting things that's happening in the, in the program now. It's ironic and sort of sad that the greatest advancements in prosthetics happen because of a war. We're seeing people, because of great battlefield medicine, are getting out of there alive and coming back missing limbs. The necessity is the mother of invention, and that's, that's kind of how prosthetics works. I don't know whether you experienced this, but the, uh, when I, finally lived. You know, when you said you almost died a couple times last night, I can relate because that happened to me too. And when I finally got out of the hospital after the first six months, I love food so much. I couldn't, everything tasted like a gourmet. You know, the difference between a military hospital patient and a civilian is that as civilians, we're allowed to whine and moan. And the military people are up at six. Yes, sir. Yeah, how many laps, you know? Okay. The kids I met in at Walter Reed, were so anxious to get back to their units and to their comrades. That purpose is pretty amazing. Today we're gonna to discuss a few things, but I wanna give you some statistics and numbers just to start us off with. Right now there's 1.7 million Americans that are uh, living with lost limbs. Uh, 185,000 people have an amputation every year. Biomedical research, bioengineering are working to develop the latest in prosthetics. It's good to be alive, and it's, it's great to see young men like uh, Tim Karcher go, you know, it's only been two years, and the, he knows more about prosthetics than I do, and I've been doing it 33 years. The character I've played for 11 years is fascinated by stem cell research and all kinds of things. You need dreamers and visionaries and people that will ignore you when you say, uh, you can't do that. I'm excited about new research. I'm 
glad that there are researchers out there taking risks. I need a wheelchair if I want to walk a long distance. And if there are prosthetic advancements that will enable me to stand in line a long time or do all these other things that you take for granted, sign me up. And how's it going today? It's going well. How's the, how's the new sleeve working? It's pretty good. I'm just about to check the signals. The goal for, for any prosthetic, whether it be upper or lower, ultimately would be to have it work in a very natural way. So meaning that I don't have to learn how to use it. It understands what I want to do and is able to adapt to that. You know, right, like what right. works best for them right. and what's most efficient well, that's, for them. Yeah, I mean, that's the important thing here is that we can right. customize it to what they need. Exactly. Not, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. For lower extremity prosthetics, we believe that many of the technologies that we're developing can potentially help, um, particularly in, in the area of sensory feedback. As this technology advances, some of that technology that we use in the hand could possibly be translated into a, a, a dexterous foot that would contour or help with balance on, a, on uneven terrains. Uh, because it's very important when we walk, we get a sense of balance, and, and that doesn't come visually. It comes from the messages that we're getting from our, you know, our ankle and our legs and our knees. Uh, and to be able to provide that information back to somebody would be very valuable. For the lower limb, you have the benefit of contacting the ground. So you have that gravitational force pushing back on you. Ultimately, for somebody like Robert David Hall, we'd like to be able to provide prosthetics that really act like his natural legs acted. So that, you know, for him to use those legs, it's, it's a very natural thing. Uh, he, he doesn't have to use any assistive devices to help maintain his balance anymore. So we'll go, you know, go ahead and go through some of the motions here. So. Well, our hope is that over the next few years, we'll be able to get this out to more and more people. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then I want to find out about all of you. And this is a bigger class than I thought there would be, but we'll work with that. Today, I am going to teach a class at the Media Access Office. And it's dedicated to helping people with disabilities who would like to become actors. I, I've been the chairman of the Screen Actors Guild Performers with Disabilities group for about 12 years now. I owe my career to that guy telling me I couldn't do something. So if you know this is what you want to do, don't let anybody deter you. Go for it. It's a tough racket for anybody, able-bodied or disabled, but it's even tougher for actors with disabilities. Um, I'm an actress, singer, and a writer. I was bit by the bug as a little girl just watching my dad on stage. I'm, I'm still voice acting. I wrote and performed my own one-woman show at the White Buyer Theater. I just finished my uh, 35th feature film, so uh, another starring role, and it was cool. It was my first 3D movie. And in that movie, I... When you see people with disabilities as lawyers, teachers, or whatever, on TV, for example, it sends the message that, oh, uh, people with disabilities can actually do things. You know, they, they can contribute. Whatever you think of TV or movies or theater, it impacts the way we feel about our society. It's why we need more qualified, talented people with disabilities, not only in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as writers and directors and costumers and everything else. I can tell within seconds if somebody has a shot, but talent is not enough. Hard work is not enough. Experience is not enough. Opportunity is not enough. You need a, a a certain combination of all of them together. Well, we've seen people in tears. 
they haven't been able to move their arm, and, and now they can move an arm. It's very gratifying for us to, to, to be a part of it. The advancement we've seen over the past five, six years in prosthetics exceeds anything that we've seen in the past 150 years. I, I'm all for progress. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I've lived half my life as a so-called able-bodied person and half my life as a person with a disability. And it's still the same me inside my head. 